We welcome our YouTube visitors to our service here at Berkeley Congregational Church in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. I'm going to hand over to John for our intimations. Thanks, John. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone, and all those that have tuned into YouTube. Uh, we trust that you'll enjoy our, your hour with us this morning. And just some intimation before we continue. Um, we wish all our fathers, of course, today uh, a happy and enjoyable Father's Day, wherever may, you may be. And our next deacons meeting will be this Tuesday evening. It will be a Zoom meeting. And I'll be sending out the agendas to the, the deacons uh, during the course of today or early tomorrow. And then we heard, heard very sadly that one of our senior or major um, tenants, um, Gwen Marshbank, passed away during the, during the week. So our thoughts and our prayers go out to Moira and the rest of the Marshbank family and their friends. And of course you heard that, well, you didn't hear, but um, Jeanette slipped and fell and broke her arm. Uh, was it yesterday, or was it Jeff? No, or Friday. Friday. Friday, Friday. And so our thoughts and our prayers go out to, to her. Uh, she's in a lot of pain and discomfort. So we just keep her in your prayers, if you would. And then the Seniors Fellowship Group will be meeting on the 7th of July at 10 o'clock here in the, in the Long Hall. That's the Seniors Fellowship Group. And then our verse for the week comes from the book of Psalms. And in Psalm 21, we read verses 4 and 5. Psalm 121, verses 4 and 5. He will not let your foot, foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And now for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, in your mercy and loving kindness, you have promised to hear the prayers of all who call on you with their whole heart. Hear the prayer we now humbly offer to you. Remember, O oh Lord, your church. Confirm and strengthen it, increase it, and keep it in peace, and preserve it forever. Remember, Lord, our ministers and teachers, all servants in your church, which you established to feed the flock with your word. Remember, O Lord, all civil authorities, our armed forces, the city in which we dwell, and every city, every land. We pray especially at this time for the people of, the, of Ukraine and Russia. Bring this war to a swift end, Heavenly Father. Grant us and them peaceful times that we may lead a calm and tra tranquil life in all godliness and holiness. Remember, O Lord, our parents, especially our fathers on this Father's Day. Bless our brothers and sisters, our relatives and friends, and all who are near and dear to us, and grant them mercy, life, peace, health, salvation, pardon, and forgiveness of sins, that they may forever praise and glorify your holy name. Remember, O Lord, the young and the old, orphans and widows, the sick and the suffering, the sorrowing and the afflicted, the poor and needy. Pour out your mercy, for you are the giver of all good things. Remember, O Lord, each one of your humble servants. Grant us your grace, that each one of us may be diligent and faithful, and that we may avoid evil company and influence, and resist all temptation. Help us to lead a godly and righteous life, blameless and peaceful, always serving you. We remember, O Lord, all those who have fallen asleep in the hope of resurrection to life eternal, whom you shelter in a place of brightness and heavenly rest, where all sickness, sorrow, and sighing has fled away, and where the sight of your face gladdens all our saints. Bring each one of us at last with, with all your saints 
to glory everlasting. O Lord, to you is due all glory and worship, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to hand over to B for our, our scripture reading. B. Good morning. As we remember Gwen Marshbank, I just have to say that she would have been 92 today if she'd been alive, yes. And she was one of our longest tenants in the hall. Okay, our reading comes from John chapter, one, chapter 11, verses 1 to 44. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he prayed. He stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, there, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. <coughs> Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than three kilometers from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews, had been, the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Jesus reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, 
that he fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how they, how they loved him. Sorry. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. There were certain places that Jesus called home. The first one was, of course, Nazareth, where he grew up and where he worked as a carpenter. Um, the second place seems to have been Capernaum, which uh, is, uh, Nazareth is in the hill country. If you're looking at the map of Israel, it's right up in the, uh, in the northwest. Capernaum is right down on the seashore, and that's where Peter, Andrew, James, John lived. And, and Jesus seems to have made that his centre of ministry when he was up in the Galilee. And I think he did that because Nazareth, it tells us in the scriptures, didn't accept his ministry. Only a couple of people were healed. He couldn't do anything in Nazareth uh, because they all saw him as Jesus the carpenter and not Jesus as the Messiah. But there was a third place that Jesus called home. And it was in the Jerusalem area, not up in the Galilee, but right down the bottom. And it was at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they lived in a little village of Bethany, which was just outside Jerusalem. It's only about, what, a 40-minute walk. You walk, uh, you walk from Bethany up the hill to Bethpage, and now you're on the top of the Mount of Olives, that little village at the top. And then you walk down through the Mount of Olives, down into the Kidron Valley, and then up into Jerusalem. And Jesus used to walk that route very often. And, and we don't know how Jesus got to know this family of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The Bible doesn't tell us. Some of the commentators that I've been reading suggest that um, he was related, that he was a cousin of Jesus. While others have suggested, I think it more likely, that he got to know him through his healing ministry. But we just don't know. But however he got to know them, one thing was sure, their home was a place of refuge, it was a place of peace, it was a place, place where he could just retreat amongst friends and just relax there. It was a place he retreated after his confrontation with the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Uh, who were continually trying to trip him up or, or make him compromise his beliefs. 
uh, so that they could weaken his popularity and ridicule his ministry. But it was, it was a place where he stayed in the last days of his life. Um, he stayed there from his time when he came into Jerusalem in that triumphal entry. You know, on, uh, on the Sunday, that last week of his life, that is where he stayed. And it, it, it's a lovely little village, Sir Edwin and I have been there. And we've actually walked that section of road from Bethany up to Bethpage and then down through the Mount of Olives and into, the, into Jerusalem. And it's a lovely walk. But uh, as he walked into the house this day, a few days after Lazarus' death, it certainly wasn't a place of refuge. It certainly wasn't a place of peace because the whole house was in chaos. The tables and chairs would have been overturned, all turned upside down and just scattered around the room. Um, the pots and the pans and the cutlery had been taken off of the shelves and thrown onto the floor. And uh, they lay in messy heaps all over the place. The wall hangings which hung in every Jewish home had been ripped off of the wall and just thrown onto the floor and just <coughs> left lying where they had fallen. And all of it had been done on purpose. Within minutes of Lazarus's death, the two sisters had systematically gone around the house and just turned calm into chaos. They turned order into disorder. The and, and, and what they were trying to do was to reflect the chaos, the misery and the hurt and the uncertainty that had struck their home with the death of their brother. It was all part of the ritual that surrounded Jewish, um, the death of, um, of a loved one in, in the Jewish community. Bodies were buried as quickly as possible um, because just like in this country, the climate demanded it, the body starts to rot and to stink very, very quickly. While the body was in the house being prepared for burial, there was no eating, there was no drinking allowed at all. Deep mourning lasted for seven days after the death. The first three days were for what they called weeping. And every woman in the village, listen to this, every woman in the village was expected to come and to weep with the family over those three days. And uh, that, that weeping was loud, it was dramatic. You know, we, we get some kind of evidence of it when you see the conflict in the Middle East between the Palestinians and the Israelites, uh, Israelis. Uh, you know, someone dies and they march through the street and they are screaming and wailing and performing. That's what used to happen. The women would come down and for three days, every single one of them came to the uh, Mary and Martha and weep and loudly and dramatically. And during those seven days, it was forbidden to wash, to wear shoes, or to do any kind of business. Everything stopped. And those first few days of mourning were followed by what they called 30 days of light mourning. And during this time, it was the duty of every member of the village, every member, to come and pay their respects to the family. What a contrast to us today, hey? Eh? What a contrast. Uh, you, you know, instead of expressing our feelings like Mary and Martha did, we bottle them up inside. We, 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 and, and I think we actually hide between two misconceptions. The first one is that stupid British Victorian Edwardian uh, attitude which talks about a stiff upper lip. You know. it, 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 it has done more damage to people's emotions than anything else. You know. It's an attitude that says we are not allowed to show our emotions. Uh, have you ever heard, you know, oh, she, he, she uh, shows his emotions on his sleeve. 
Uh, that used to be an old expression. Oh, he shows his religion, and his, which means he would talk about it, share about it, be excited about it. Oh, you're not allowed to do that. I mean, that, that's absolute stupidity. Yeah. And it's an attitude that says we have to grin and bear pain and hurt that we may be going through and present a brave face to the world. Why? Why? You know, what people don't understand is that, you know, expression and, and hurt and sorrow has to be worked through. Grief cannot be bottled up. If it is, it actually expresses itself in some other kind of way. Crying is good for us. To let our, add our emotions and to express our grief is actually good for us. We need to talk about our grief. As I say, if we don't express our grief, it will show itself up in another way, even to the point of mental illness and breakdown. And do you know the other reason? Because we're Christians. And it's also stupid. We, we, we live under the misconception that because we believe in heaven, which is a wonderful place, and I'm hoping to go there one day if he lets me in, and, and those that believe in Christ, we believe that they go to be with God, who seems to be a very nice guy, yeah. We call him Father. And we have verses in the Bible that says, you know, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Somehow we Christians believe that to be scared of death, or to express our fears, our loneliness, and our hurts, due to death or even anger at the death of a loved one, somehow we actually feel that we're betraying our God, we're betraying our Jesus, and we're betraying our faith. And I've never heard such rubbish in my life. You know, let me assure you, I'm, I'm, I'm scared of death. I'm scared of the process of death. Uh, I'm, I'm scared of losing one of my family, Sir Ridwin, my boys, my daughters-in-law, my grandchildren. I don't know how I'll handle it because I haven't had to face it. And, and I just hope my faith works itself through that grief. I'm sure you've heard of a, someone called uh, C.S. Lewis. Yeah, Jack Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis, one of the great Christian, you know, uh, um, sorry, uh, missionaries, you could say, but uh, uh, he, he, the books he has written, but do you know he nearly lost his faith when his wife, Joy, died? He married late in life, married an American. If you get a chance, see the film Shadowlands, and you might get a... Now, now C.S. Lewis believed that, you know, pain was part of God's plan, but when pain actually came into his life, he couldn't handle it. I, I hope that I can handle it. And this is the first thing I want to talk about, is that grief that we, we go through. You know, it, it is a process. And we have to be able to express our grief and let people know how we are grieving. We don't need to bottle it up. You know, um, I watched my mother die in, in anger. And let me tell you, I was angry with God. Oh, I was angry. I, I, I didn't pray for a long, long time. And I was supposed to be a Christian leader at the time. I wasn't in the ministry, but I, um, I was one of the leaders in the church. And, and I was angry. If I could have got, got seen God at that moment, I would have punched him on the floor. No, I'm sorry. You know, how could a God like that allow my mum to die in such an ugly way with cancer? And I was angry. And it was only the faith of Sir Edwin and those around me that actually got me through that period. You know, um, and, and, and you know, one of the things I fear, having a stroke <coughs> and lying there. I, I knew a, a lady, uh, Doody, Doody Oates, and, and uh, her husband, George. Doody had a stroke and she lived for 10 years after the stroke. And she, uh, uh, all she could say, the only word that she could say was no, no. Would you like a cup of tea, Doody? No. She couldn't say any other word. Uh, and George sat with her 
from morning till the nurses kicked him out at night in the nursing home for 10 years. Two lives were destroyed at that time. I just hope that if I have a stroke, please go. Who's the nicest person in this congregation apart from me? <laughs> I bring a pillow and just put it over my face and just let me go, please. That's how I feel. I really do. I'm, I, I don't want to go through that process of, of lingering death. You know, but I'm not worried to tell you this. Listen to somebody else. What happened to somebody else as he was facing grief and hurt. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee <coughs> along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. To the point of death. Can you imagine how he was suffering? So stay here and watch with me. He, he had an idea of what was coming. Going a little further, he fell down on his face to the ground and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, take this cup away from me. Yet, not I, as I will, but your will be done. Grief. That's the first thing. But I want to say that beyond grief, there is blessing. That's the second thing. And I'd like to tell you a story. It's about Martin Luther, the great reformer of the 16th century. Uh, when he left the monkhood and he married um, Katie or Katrina, his, his wife, they had a little girl called Magdalena. And she was 14 years old when she became sick and lay dying. And Luther prayed, Oh God, I love her so. Nevertheless, thy will be done. And then he turned to his daughter and said, Magdalena, uh, would you rather be with me or would you rather go to be with your father in heaven? And the girl said, Father, as God wills. Luther lifted her in his arms as she died. And as they laid her to rest, he said, O oh, my Magdalene, you will rise and you will shine like the stars in the, uh, in the sun. How strange it is to be so sorrowful and yet to know that all is at peace, that all is well. Beyond grief, beyond the yelling and the, the wailing and the pain, there can be peace. It's not wrong to be afraid of death or to show one's feelings. It was just as it was wrong for Mary and Martha to show their grief and their anguish at the loss of their brother. And it's only when we are honest with ourselves about our grief that we can hear the same words that transformed the lives of Mary and Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even <coughs> though they die. And whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Those last words of Jesus to Mary and Martha. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe it? And this is the question I'm asking you. Beyond grief, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe this? You've got to answer that and only you can answer that. Do you believe? See, with those words, chaos and grief and despair become hope. 
That is the hope beyond our pain. And with hope comes belief. And with belief comes resurrection. And with resurrection, there comes eternal life. You know, over the last few weeks, we have examined how Jesus interacts with certain people, how he confronts people. And in every case, no matter what the situation might be, or what they found themselves, the situation they found themselves in, he brings a message of hope. Whether it's Nicodemus worried about whether Jesus is the Messiah and struggling with his faith, Jesus brings hope. Whether it's the woman at the well, up in Samaria, she's, an, she, she's ostracized by the rest of her community. He brings hope to her and he brings hope to the town in which she lives. Whether it's the woman caught in adultery and thrown at his feet, he brings that hope. Go and do not sin. Do not uh, uh, go and leave your life of sin. Or as the old King James, go and sin no more. He brings hope. Every time he touches a life, he brings hope. And in this situation of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, that message comes through far louder and clearer than at any other time as Christ moves into their lives and gives them the gift of hope. So life moves on once again, beyond death. To believe in Jesus Christ is not only to have the assurance of resurrection and eternal life, it is also to experience here and now the peace and the joy that that belief brings. I, I'm going to finish with what I believe is a true story. Uh, it's told of uh, a distinguished man, the only white person to be buried in a Georgia cemetery reserved exclusively for black people. He had lost his mother when he was a baby and his father, who never married again, hired a black woman called Mandy to, uh, to help raise his son. She was a Christian and she took her task very seriously. And he, he maintained that he loved, she loved him as if he was her child. And one of his earliest memories of Mandy was that every morning she would bend over him uh, as he uh, slept in the upstairs bedroom and she would wake him and say, Wake up! God's morning has come. As the years passed, this devoted woman continued to serve as his substitute mother the young man went on to college, he would come home and each holiday and summer she would climb the stairs more slowly now and call him in the same loving way, wake up, God's morning is coming. One day after he had become a successful statesman, the sad message came, man, he is dead. Can you attend a funeral? And as he stood by her grave, he turned to his friend and he said, when I die, and if that's before Jesus comes, I want to be buried here next to Mandy. I'd like to think that on Resurrection Day she will speak to me again and say, Good, wake up, my boy. God's morning is coming. You know, the sentiment is, is true. It, 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 it rings so gratefully true. But he got something wrong. It won't be Mandy who will be saying that. It will actually be the Lord. And he will be saying, Wake up, my children. Morning has come. And do you know that's the hope of every Christian? Every Christian. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. But Christ has indeed been risen from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. And as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus put it this way, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Amen.
Let us pray. <coughs> God our Father, we thank you for the word. Send us out in the peace and the joy of knowing that you are the resurrection and the life. And now may God bless you, Christ take care of you, the Holy Spirit enlighten you all the days of your life. The Lord be your defender of body and of soul, now and forever.